the growth of your favorite digital show with just a text. Support Larry Reed Live by texting GIVE to 404-800-4530. Text G-I-V-E to 404-800-4530 today. All right, welcome to Larry Reed Live. This is what I need for you guys to do. What I need for you to do is to share right now. It is Saturday morning. I don't know if I've ever came on the show on a Saturday morning ever. But if I have right now, I cannot remember it. But I'm on right now. And today we are going to have a very candid, open, expanded conversation about what has been happen happening over the last week and a half as relates to these viral videos and these other leaked videos. I'm, I be trying to tell y'all folks to keep your hoes happy. If you keep your hoes happy, your mess won't get out. But then if you don't keep your hoes happy, then your stuff is going to get out. What do I mean? Now, I'm not telling anybody to have four, five, six different sexual partners. That ain't what I'm saying. But I am sort of saying do wrong right. If you are married and you're going to have a hoe, you're going to have a side chick, you're going to be in adultery. Well, then make sure the adulteress or the adult man, <laughs> whoever you frickin'. Make sure that you are taking care of them. What you mean? There's wages to sin. There is a sin debt, and you got to pay it. So if you're going to be having sex with somebody that's not the person you're supposed to be having sex with, well, then you need to be making sure you're paying your sin bill. Take care of them. They already know you're not going to take them out for the birthday. They're not going to take you out for Christmas. Well, you can do birthday. As long as it don't fall on a day that's near your wife's birthday or your significant other birthday. And y'all just got to go with me. I know y'all probably, oh, I can't believe he's giving this advice, but I'm just trying to help. I'm trying to keep you off of LRL. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to keep you off of LRL. <sighs> so this is what you got to do. They already know they can't have Thanksgiving. They cannot have Christmas. They cannot have Easter. They cannot have uh, all them other holidays, Hanukkah. Uh, what, what is it? Uh, um, um, Yom Kippur and the Rosh Hashanah. I don't know. Y'all know my mind get filled up when I start doing this show. But anyway, whatever the special day is, they know they got to have the day before or the day after. They already know that. But what I'm saying is when you take them out the day before you can do whatever you're going to do, make sure you buy them something really nice. You make sure you give them some money on their rent or cover the rent or their mortgage, cover their note a couple of times, take them out, pay some meals, cash app them some money here and there randomly. That's what you're supposed to do. I don't understand. Then just be smarter. Jesus, lamb. But anyway, get back. I don't got all. Getting back to the videos that have happened during this week, about a week and a half. You got gospel artists, preachers, ministers, pastors, bishops. Y'all mess is leak, leaking out. The folk that y'all doing what you doing with, y'all must have did something wrong or done popped off of them. Because now they sending it to the vloggers. They sending it to me and they know it. And see, this is the thing. Y they, if, them them hoes is manipulative. Because they sent it to me that, no, I'm not going to talk about it unless it's public. So some of them, what I don't find out, some of the niggas be doing, what they be doing. They actually will go online and leak the story first, so get me talking about it. Then probably send the video to Obnoxious or send it to King Jobs or send it to Layla Lynn, or Unwind with Tasha K. You know, the second side used to go to her before they even go to all of them before they come to us. You know, and then 
They just real manipulate with that thing, trying to get you out there. For real. Oh, it's a sad thing. It's just terrible, damn boy. But anyways, them came out. And then them two that was in the sanctuary, I named the vi video Sanctuary Suckers. No, what a sanctuary suck. That's what I call it. But there was a sanctuary sucker. Now, these are the pictures that are going around saying about who they are. But only one we shoe on as far as Larry's research is the dark skin one. The light skin one, I'm not sure if that is him in the video. I'm not 100%. But this right here is the, li is the little boy that was saying, <laughs> that's the goblin giggler. That's what I go. He said, <laughs> he threw that thing on his face and he went right back to just gobbling it up. I said, I ain't seen nothing like this in my whole life. Oh, Jesus was terrible. Well, anyway, with all of this going on, I have been saying for on the how long on the platform that we, the church, and black folk, the community, need to have a more expanded conversation about sex and sexuality. You heard me talk about that with Cardin Pearson on the line. I probably even said it during the, vid during the interview with Bishop Bernard Jordan. But when I was talking to Carton, we was talking through text, and I said, you know, it would be wonderful if I could talk to Bishop Yvette Flunder. That's Carton right there. Look at him smiling. He's such a nice mind. I said, it would be nice to talk to Bishop Yvette Flunder. You think that she would be open to it? And I guess he know her really good. He was like, yeah, of course. She would definitely have this conversation. She would love to have it with you. So he connected us. And let me tell you, you guys. Now, all y'all always have so much to say about these people, particularly the church people, Carton Pearson, E. Bernard Jordan, and Yvette Flunder. Bring her over to see her pictures. She's so just pretty smile. She just, she's actually a pretty woman. And let me tell you this. These are the nicest people I think I had ever met in my life. Beside my uh, best friend, Mama, Mama May. That's what I call it. That, is a, that woman is sweet as pie. Lord, when I get me some, a good old piece of change, I'm going to make sure I send her some money and bless her. That's a nice woman. You know, then I got my cousin Janice Faye, my Aunt Chicken, and some other folk. You know, but as far as out here in these streets, this is a nice woman. Cotton Pearson, Cotton Pearson. Very nice. Bishop E. Bernard. You ain't got no picture of him, do you? You should have. Put my mentor down here in this picture. I'm going to be mentioning his name here and there. You better put his picture in there. Put it in there. Go faster. And I want you to delete Willie and delete Smilly out, out my database. I, we we got to go get pictures. I got to look at all of them. I'm sick of them. Oh, I'm so sick of talking about them. I can't take it. I can't take it. <sighs> yeah, bring bring him over with them. Or bring no, bring him over right now. Bring him over. I'm talking about him, Bishop E. Bernard Jordan. This is a nice mind. It's a very nice mind. Now you make one with all three of them because we're gonna talk about this course. But today we are gonna have a more expanded conversation as it relates to sex and sexuality. And Bishop Yvette Flun, some people when I posted in Patreon, you know, they know everything first before it even come out public. They were like, okay, we don't know who she is. But then I said. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for Reed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Folks without home, they are in. Y'all didn't know if that's what they. That's what she said. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for Reed. It won't me. Y'all put me in there. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done for Reed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Folks without homes. They are in the streets, and the blood and the drug habits. Some say they just can't be. Those when hold on, muggers and robbers. No place seems to be safe. I'm, I got to sing it. Y'all sing it with me now because I can't play it. Cause YouTube gonna try to get me. But you've been my protection every step of the way, and I wanna say, I hear y'all. Make sure you swim right. You got your black and white on. Hey, hey, hey. it could have been read. Thank you. Outdoors, thank you. Everybody just really fuck up the thank you part. Every church go out there, they don't even do the changes that Walter Hawkins put in the song. Like, y'all better do this song right. Walter Hawkins is going to get y'all. Anyway, this is the original singer. And for those in the black church, not only was she like one of the first females to ever hear, aside from um, I Own A Lot, and now it's Bishop Jack and McCullough. The only few women that carry the title, Bishop, Carolyn Showell, and, but 
she was one of the first ones I ever known to, uh, first of all, be a pastor and then be a, a bishop and then to be a gay female. Yes, she is married. Now, I think, she didn't have to val val validate this. I think her wife is the other female out of the Walter Hawkins group, Shirley. And if that's the case, she's the one that's saying, oh, happy day. I don't know if that's right. That might not be right. You know, I y'all know I was in church my whole life singing all this music, but I don't know nothing about culture. I don't know nothing about them organizations. I had to find all that out. I mean, God couldn't have chose nobody better to sit here in this chair and do Larry Live because I don't be knowing none of y'all except your music. I was in a in a in a off brand church. What I mean is we want culture, we want the Baptist, we want the Church of God and well, you know, I see I'm messing them up sitting right here, cool JC. You know all the different organizations, PAW, we were off-brand, independent, a no-name church. Mm-hmm. So I really don't know everybody the way that y'all be knowing people, you know, so. This is what I want you to do right now. I want you to share because she is on the line and we're about to have a conversation for about an hour. We're going to get to know her and then get into this brilliant mind. She is just as brilliant. I reviewed her stuff. This woman is just as brilliant as Carton Pearson, E. Bernard. I think in the black community, these, these people, along with Oprah, um, Jakes, and some of the rest of them, th this is a, our Deepak Chopra's, our, uh, what's that white man be hollering at? Talking like this right here. The motivation to speak, he's sort of smart. This is who we got to look to when it comes to these people. T.D. Jakes, uh, who has his name? Or oh, Ian Lavanza. We ain't got a whole lot of thinkers. We ain't really got a whole bunch of them. Even um, Farrakhan. I don't want to say his name. They might shut down my video because then took him off social media. Oh, that's why y'all got to go ahead and join my Patreon. Cause I ain't going to never stop these conversations, but social media might stop me. But I have you in Patreon. I can point you to my website. And I promise I'm going to always do what I'm doing right now. So she's on the line. So what we're going to do. We are going to go to a break. It is imperative that you patronize these people that I advertise for because their services are good, including mine. But the first person I want to introduce you to, those of you who may be your first time watching, is Bishop or Dr. Shama Womack. He is the modern day Dr. Sebi. Sebi. How do you say the man's name? Mine is all the wise because he is not a whoremonger. But anyway. This man, if you got it, he can heal it. But he can pull it up out the earth and show you what God meant for you to do with what is around here coming up out the ground. Cancers, AIDS, HIV, lupus, all sorts of things cured by this man. Watch this commercial on the line right now is already Bishop Yvette Falunder. When we come back, we're going to be talking to her. Take this moment now to share. <laughs> Want to become a wellness coach or holistic health counselor? Get certified with Dr. Womack. As a master herbalist with over 30 years of experience, your learning and your training will be extensive. Go to bishopwomack.com, click services, and go to the wellness portal and begin healing yourself and others today. Holistic doctor and educator Shema Womack can help you discover how to eat your way to healing get out of debt, improve your well-being, and live the prosperous life. Join him weekly on Wellness Wednesdays on a live conference call for teaching and a free question and answer session. Wellness Wednesdays with the prophetic physician. Join by dialing 888-601-9625. That's 888-601-9625. The prophetic physician. Call him on Wednesday. Listen to his teaching. And at the end, you can ask him any questions scot-free on Wednesdays. Make sure you write that number down. Get your diabetes and all that kind of stuff going on together. All right. Live on the line is Bishop Yvette Falunda. And we are about to have an expanded conversation about sex and sexuality as relates to the church. Today's show is called The Church in the Closet. The Church in the Closet. And this brilliant mind is on the line right now. So let's go ahead and welcome her in, Bishop Yvette Flunder. I hope you're doing well today. How are you today, ma'am? 
I'm doing very well today, brother. How are you? I cannot complain. And I'm, I just want to say thank you so very much for allowing me this opportunity to talk with you and have this conversation. I believe you can help the people that watch the LR Ellers and those that will come and watch this interview make some sense of some of what is going on. But first, I want to get to know you a little bit better. Now, when I saw you, I mean, you are forever in the soundtrack of my spiritual life. Right now, what they're seeing on the line, they're seeing a capture from the, the famous video, Thank You, when you performed as the lead singer with Walter Haw Hawkins. Now, that's when I got introduced to you. So catch us up to that point. Where are you from? Your parents? When did you get in the coach at church? And how did you end up right there singing Thank You to the World? Well, I have a rich history in the Church of God in Christ. Mm -hmm. I am what I call a, a high-born, Kojic <laughs> child. My grandfather uh, worked closely with Bishop Mason very back in the early, early years of the mm -hmm. Church of God in Christ, uh, Bishop E.E. E. Hamilton. And he was a pioneer in the Bay Area here, uh, planted a church called Emmanuel Church of God in Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, my father's father, uh, who was Elder Connor, came from Oklahoma and was the founding pastor of what became Ephesian Church of God in Christ. Mm -hmm. After he left, uh, after he passed away, Bishop E.E. E. Cleveland from Oklahoma came. Uh, Bishop Ernestine Ring is the daughter of Bishop E.E. E. Cleveland. Wow. And so my family is an old Kojic family. My grandfather was on Bishop Mason's board, my uncle, Bishop W.W. W. Hamilton was the general secretary of the board of bishops for the Church of God in Christ, the general board. And so my family goes way, way back mm. in Kojic. And that's where I was born and raised as a Kojic child. And I might say a happy Kojic child mm. for many, many years in the womb of the Church of God in Christ. And that's my background. And I would also suggest that there are three specific things that moved me from being able to continue the path of being a, a Kojic woman in the ways in which I was being trained. Mm -hmm. uh, one of which was my strong call to social justice ministry. Mm -hmm. I had some real concerns about why we were not more deeply involved mm -hmm. in doing the work that needed to be done as it related to social justice issues and, you know, more specifically concerned about uh, the earth, concerned about ending war, concerned about basic human and civil rights for people of color and inner city people. I got moved in that direction very early as a kid, and most people who knew me knew I was sort of always on a soapbox about that. Mm. So that was my a principal concern. I think the, the secondary concern was that I knew as a young woman that I was called to a, a greater charge of ministry as a woman mm -hmm. than the church was willing to give me. I knew mm -hmm. that from very, very young. And mm -hmm. I kept pushing uh, against uh, the opportunities for women being so limited. And I also wanted theological education and such, but all of that was not available to me as a woman. And what, then year, the third what, issue, what, what year was this? Um, oh, I was young. I'm, I'll, I will be 64 in a few days. Okay. And so this was when I was in my uh, early to middle 20s. I was a bit of a, a, a deep thinker at an early time. Let's okay. put it that way. <laughs> okay, got you, got you. Okay. So, sort of like that. And then, and then the third issue was when I sensed myself to be a same gender loving woman. Mm-hmm. When I sensed that I was a same gender loving woman, I might also add that I, I realized early that I wasn't alone, that there was a very robust uh, network of same gender loving people in my very uh, conservative church. Which was the and Church that, of God and uh, Christ Church? Which was the Church of God and Christ, yes. Yeah. Well, in the, in the network, you know, because I was uh, a part of a network. Mm -hmm. Because, again, I was involved in so many things as a child of an um, important family 
mm. in the Church of God in Christ. And so I found out that there was, a, again, a robust number of same gender loving people, for the most part, uh, on, the, on the down low, on the under, but present. Um, and I never had to leave church, and ne- I would not have had to leave church to be saying gender loving. That wasn't necessary. So let me ask, so let me say, can the we reason pause? I had to, the the reason I had to leave the church of God in Christ was because I didn't want to pretend that I wasn't saying gender loving. Now, wait a minute. Can I call you Yvette? Oh, certainly. It's, it's Yvette, by the way. Yvette, yes, e- okay, Yvette. Yes, um, pronounced Yvette. Yes. Okay, now that is a very interesting statement that you're making. Today's title of the of a show that we're interviewing you is the Church in the Closet, and that is very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, and you and uh, wow. Bishop Carlton Pearson really are helping me, and I know somebody else understand that world. Um, although I was raised in holiness, I don't think that. Mm-hmm. There was anything that said, do not be who you are, if it or hide it. Mm-hmm. If anything, there was mm-hmm. whatever you are that isn't right according to the scripture or right according to Jesus now, then you need to take that thing to prayer and get and get it worked out. It wasn't that you had to hide anything. Mm-hmm. Now, that's my experience and the experience of most of my family members that grew up in that independent holiness but Baptist church. So you said you did not want to, you realized you were same gender loving, but you did not want to closet yourself. And so that was one the reason why you had to leave the church of God in Christ. So can you bring me into that yes. world, son, and talk about it for those who don't understand that kind of world? It primarily, uh, I had to make that decision because I could not live my life without integrity. And it, it, it did not make sense to me that I would be who it is that I both was and am. And that God would require me in order to be successful in the work of ministry or in my life as a coach of kids, that God would require me to lie. Mm. I could not understand that. I, I could not understand. So my first uh, foray into this was to seek to be delivered. Because that seemed to have been the thing to do. It, I would have to seek to be delivered so that I could anticipate that God would use me. And then I would stay in the church. And I, I you know, I push back against a lot of people that say, well, then, you know, you don't seek the Lord or you didn't seek the Lord, you didn't ask God. They, they would have had to know me as a young woman. Mm-hmm. And the people that did know me know how much seriousness I would have applied to this. Mm. And such, you know, fasting and praying and and seeking counseling and crying out and going before God and begging God to, to deliver me and set me free, living my life virtually celibate. Because, by the way, to be same gender loving is not just what you do. It is who you are, whether mm-hmm. you're doing something or not. It's an orientation, not an activity. Okay. Can, you, so can, you, can you take a moment right there? For about 30 yeah, seconds yeah. and talk about the difference between an, it being an activity and it being an orientation. An orientation has everything to do with what it is in terms of sexual or intimate desire, how you are oriented. What is it that moves you? Not so much, again, what you do, but what you feel and how deeply you feel it. And my orientation tended to be more toward women than toward men. I, you know, I'm somewhere perhaps on a, um end of scale um, bisexual reality from the standpoint that I have been married. I've been married to a man. Oh, didn't know Before that. Before I became married to a woman, I was married to a man. And he was also gay. Wait. And what we were trying to do, I think, is what a lot of Kojic kids do and other people who are in fundamentalist background, you try to cancel out each other's gay. You know what I mean? Whoa. <laughs> um, wow. It, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. I can tell you that. But I will also say that um, I did what was expected of me to try to push back against me. And one day when I was praying and I was earnestly praying, and, and, and this is to say to all the people that say that then you didn't really pray in earnest. 
then I would say back to them, then you don't know me, and you don't know my heart for God. Hmm. And I sought hmm. God, and I sought God and fasted, and while I was fasting and praying, I heard what I believed to be an almost audible voice from God that spoke to me and said, this is your issue, not mine. Oh, my God. Okay, let, let me share this. With, let, me, let, me, let me share this. Let me share this. Okay. Okay, now, in my family, of course, everybody knows the prophets, preachers, however, but there was also this ancestral mm-hmm. thing that was happening. So mm-hmm. I believe that because of the sexual abuse and the mm-hmm. being um, exposed to sex very early, that a lot mm-hmm. of my family members have went a different lifestyle. You know, they're all different type of lifestyles in, in mm-hmm. my family. Now, for me, it created a sexual addiction and this thing with porn and things of this nature. So when I was in mm-hmm. this whole mm-hmm. spiritual thing, I really was trying to kill my entire sex drive and everything. This is why I, I said we got to mm-hmm. have a more expanded conversation about sex and sexuality. It was a very mm-hmm. similar phrase that was very audible to me from God that was like, look, that's, your, that's just your humanity. You know, you you don't mm-hmm. have to not be sexual. Let you let, let you just mm-hmm. need to get educated and find out what's going on and and dis, have a little bit of discovery, which the church did not really push mm-hmm. us to have any any fine any um, form of discovery. Whether we talk about heterosexuality or homosexuality, it would just put it on lockdown mm-hmm. till you get married. So that is mm-hmm. very, very, very interesting. God said to you, he said, that's your issue, that's mm-hmm. not mine. Not, not his. And from that day till this, I decided to turn my face toward God and hear God about this and hear less of the cultural scuttlebutt and ideas. And, and, be, and here's the reason why. Because I learned that repression leads to obsession. Whoa. Okay, let's hit. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I got to do like Carton. I got to. Okay. <laughs> y'all just be dropping stuff. and <laughs> Keep right on going. Everybody, everybody ain't, ain't, ain't got it. Ain't been sitting in this. Listen to what she said. I need for y'all to type this. Repression creates. What do you, how do you say it? It leads to obsession. It leads to obsession. You all heard me say, I don't know how many times, suppression and repression of sexuality, I believe it creates a, 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 a sex neurosis. I mean, towards like deviancy yeah. and, and misbehavior. And look at what we're seeing now, you guys, this week. These guys in this sanctuary doing what they were doing. Um, I think a whole lot of the whole BDMS world, this is my opinion, I think a whole lot of this stuff, these pastors are trafficking these children or sleeping with these young children and other things that we see, I mean, we could get into other more expanded conversation about that, but I do think some of this stuff is people exploring and they are trying to discover and, and, and or manifesting uh, their sexuality in these different ways because they're repressing it and just pops up all different types of ways. Okay, continue that conversation. That's, That's interesting. True. And let me, let me go a little further and say that as a, as a kid in a traditionally conservative environment, we learned about sex very poorly. For the most part, we were encouraged to get married to have sex. Yeah. And it came without an instruction book, okay, uh, where, where we do learn about it, essentially. So we didn't really know how to do it. And people got married, married very early, in many cases, so they could have sex. Because mm. that was the only way that you could legally have sex. Mm. And the consequence of what is, pe- people didn't know much about the human body. They didn't know much about how to appreciate each other's body. They didn't know where the happy parts of your body were. <laughs> yeah. And the unhappy parts. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody really <laughs> taught you that, right? Yeah. And again, the consequence, and let me also add, people were taught that sexuality only comes in the binary, a heterosexual binary. Essentially, men are this way, Women are this way. Mm-hmm. People are on all sorts of different places on the spectrum. 
Okay, that's 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 that how women are now. And that's that's something else. Um, Yvette is mm -hmm. the I I believe sex and sexuality is on a spectrum. I, I believe that. And I know a lot of mm -hmm. preachers do not and I don't know if there's any space for that in the church or in Christianity or in our sacred Bible. I don't know if there any when I say space for that, what I mean is there's no conversation. It's it's either male or female, sex and marriage or fornication. There's there's no and it can stay like that. If you're watching me and, and that's what you believe and, and that's the, the crux of my faith and the faith of many of you that are watching. But what I am saying and the purpose of this show and shows like it is there has to be conversation when there when it's not like that, when it's not that black and white, when when the woman wants but a let's woman. Move to that. Let's, let's move to that. Let's just say if this was such a simple question with simple answers that are addressed in the Bible then let's move beyond the old wise tale in terms of the interpretation of the scripture or the common belief systems that are cultural, that we say come from the scripture. Okay. And, and let, me, let me begin theologically by saying to you, what does Jesus say about sex and sexuality for the most part? Well, um... and, and the answer to that question is virtually nothing. Yeah. Not in terms of how to be engaged in it in a beautiful and fruitful way. Yeah. There's nothing there. In fact, let me push the envelope a little bit further. Okay. According to the text, we don't have any evidence that Jesus was ever involved or engaged sexually with anyone. Anyone. True. Yet we suggest that Jesus was very human and very divine. Well, I don't know a very human man who does not have some engagement sexually. Amen. Either with himself or with somebody else. I, I, and in fact, yeah. in fact, if if you don't have some engagement physiologically, your body will engage itself in the night while you sleep. That's right. Nighttime emissions. Am I? Am I? And it happens because there's a physiological need for that release. Mm -hmm. Very human. It's not a spirit. This is not a spiritual conversation we're having here. But when we say that Jesus was very man, why was he, by the, by the writers and those who chose the book that made up our canon, why was Jesus devoid of any human sexuality? Well, could it, could it be? And though there's something could, intrinsically evil mm -hmm. about something that is such a natural reality. Okay, and so could it be that we don't see that about Jesus or we don't read that about Jesus because of how the canon were put together? Maybe, maybe that's the reason yes. why. I mean, but let me ask you this. And because there, was an, because there was an evil that was associated with sex from the very beginning, an evil. And because it is such a powerful force, I would tend to believe that humankind wanted to control it by closeting it. And so it is unfair for us to say that Jesus was very human and not be able to conceptualize in our mind that this beautiful brown Palestinian Jewish man was not ever uh, allowed to feel anything passionate for anyone and to respond sexually. Well, of course. Now, well, what does that say? Now, of, now I'm going to say this. You, but one, more, one more line. Mm -hmm. When you pray to Jesus and ask Jesus to help you with sex, it's a, and I remember as a teenager praying one day and asking Jesus, then I thought for a minute, why am I asking you? <laughs> Why I'm asking you when you don't even know what I'm talking about? Because let you say anything. Uh, Isn't that amazing? Yes, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And, and brother, and here's another truth. Jesus never wrote anything. Yeah. Everything that we have that Jesus said was written by someone who said he said it. Exactly. 
And and you know I don't. And I, and, but this is the thing. I don't have. You know, what did you say? I don't have any problem with that. But there's so many fundamental Christians that have a problem with say, with saying one of the things the creeds for the uh, churches that I had was we believe that the Holy Bible is the inspired word written by men about God. And yes. people have a problem with that. And they think you're trying to wiggle yourself out of the out of a biblical truth somewhere. No, we just want you to think while you are reading that so you can understand that men wrote as they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost. They were inspired. Yes. And, and we want to even take it even farther. If you go and study and read, you see that there was some manipulation to this canon and some manipulation yes. to this yes. text. You need to know that as well. I can know that, believe that, and I still honor the scriptures and believe that it's a prophetic and, and inspired and, and one of the most powerful sacred books written. I can I can know all of that and still believe that. One of the things I wanted to ask you, um, I want to ask you, Yvette, you don't you got me. It's not Yvette. Yvette, yes. um, is Yvette. when you were on this journey. Where was it when when you began to saying thank you? Were you still married to the man? Had you all you already aware of your same gender loving attraction? But were you married yes. to a man at that time? No. When when I came when I uh, became part of Bishop Hawkins Church, I had spent some years outside of church. Oh. Because I couldn't reconcile all of it. Hmm. It was very difficult for me to reconcile um, my love for, which, by the way, I'm still a, I passionately love the Church of God in Christ. I mm -hmm. really do. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't hate on them. I yeah. love the Church of God in Christ. And, and again, um, I'm at a point in my life where I don't need to just be angry with the people who raised me. I realized that I had to uh, essentially move from that fear because of what I'm called to mm. do and be. And I believe that. And I believe that I am called out from it to also be a, a, a voice for some of the other people who are struggling with some of the same things I struggled with. So let me, let me just take an aside and say that. Yeah. So when I left Kojic, I didn't leave Kojic to go to another church. I decided that I was going to give myself, immerse myself in social justice work. And I, I began to do significant work around uh, seniors providing housing and food and um, illegal services and all sorts of things for seniors. Uh, and then I, got, I went from that to uh, doing the work around uh, specialized foster care for children who had been put out of the foster care system because they had special issues. And then from that, the HIV epidemic hit. Oh, yeah. Talk, talk about that. People, I heard about your work in that. I talk to me about that. Yeah. I, I'm still in it. I mean, for 30 years, I've been involved. Ever since we had underground uh, clinics for Compound Q, which, the, which came out before AZT. And, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I could go on and on about how many people we served and some of the people that we worked with underground are still living because of the work that we did before the drug was even made available. So I go all the way back to the beginning of the epidemic and I have buried many of the saints' children. Many. Mm. many. I have 149 obituaries in a file in my office and many of which are the children of the saints who really did not die with HIV. They died because of the fear that they had mm. of getting treatment. Mm. And that had everything. Hold on, hold, 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 hold. That, I got to take a moment. I got to take a moment. That, that, that. My God. 149 obituaries that you have found. Yes. And you say that and These it's are not, the ones that I, the funerals I, yes. And it's not because of the HIV. That's not what they died of. They died no. well, maybe what they died of, but that's not why they died. They died because right. they did they the, they wouldn't get the treatment because they were closeted. And so they did, right. they could not come to man, that is crazy. That but it's is crazy. And that closet that closet was stronger than the will to live. Essentially they they would rather have been in secret and died than gotten treatment and lived. 
That's how powerful the closet is. But see, the, for that reason alone, that's why I called today's show the, the church in the closet because for that reason alone, I don't care who in the comments, what you believe and how you view LRL, me, or um, Yvette Flunder. Do y'all hear what she's saying? We have a, a, this is a common denominator here. People are dying, church people cheering, people in the church, because the conversation is not alive in and around the church. Or, or there's, there's something that is often where people feel as though they can't have the conversation about, I have HIV, or I am same gender loving, I need to get treatment because now I have this disease. That they can't even have that conversation. That's a conversation you can have with your doctor at the hospital that may not even know Jesus. You mean to tell me at the space or in the place that Jesus supposed to live, you cannot tell the truth? <laughs> and let's go back for just a minute and say again, Jesus basically had no sexuality. There okay. was no real conversation. But also, the person we do quote more than we quote Jesus is Paul. And Paul's writing, and particularly his, his word to those that worked with him in ministry, is that he would prefer that they not marry. Because he felt that marriage was a distraction for ministry. Mm. Which I find, and, and I'm saying all this to say that we don't get any positive affirmations in many ways about an open and honest discussion about human sexuality from the text. The text doesn't provide that for us. And then as a result of that, we have this fear and um, a sort of uh, um, abject negativity about human sexuality that forces people, straight and gay, into the closet where the conversations are not healthy and the end result is there's this private sex and public shame. And in that environment, this was a rich soil for a sexually transmitted disease. Okay. And this sexually okay. transmitted disease, uh. HIV, this sexually transmitted disease, had a chance to run rampant and get out of control. And mind you, the most... The, fastest proliferation for this disease right now is among people of color, particularly of African descent and particularly men. That reality still exists for us as a community. There's so many We th- cannot arrest HIV because we cannot get theologically correct around sex and sexuality. Okay, and, and this and this is there's so much in what you said. I, I would try my best not to jump in between what you're saying, and, and that is so true That's because okay. there's no conversation between about sex and sexuality. This is the reason why we have this epidemic, this outbreak in our community and then in the black church. Absolutely. Now, now there's something Absolutely. else you said in there that I saw, and I just realized in this moment. I've said this before, but in this moment, I just realized how my spirit took in that scripture and that text about Paul, and my ex-wife is in the comments on Facebook, that destroyed my marriage. And let me tell you, how, let, me, yeah. let me explain how, what destroyed my marriage. Because Paul was, the Pauline scriptures really was like, you know, look, marriage is good, whatever, but look, you get married if you if to have sex if you can't go without sex. But you need to really focus, you really need to just focus on doing ministry. That That's basically... Yeah. And 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 that and you sort That's of right. hear that language in the, some of the fathers of the faith and some of the older people. It was like, you know, and and this is terrible for women because then the woman feel like my only goal in life is to be, you know, the quote unquote cum bucket for my husband's nuts. Right. You know that he got right. to give me several times in the night. Just dump them all out of me. That's and I take care of the children, stay in the house. I ain't gonna preach. I ain't gonna teach. I ain't gonna take no title. You know. And then there's all, all, out of that same world comes. You know, education is not important. Get to church. Your job is not important. Come right. to church. And it's you, you know your your sexuality suppress it, repress it. Come to church and serve God. Serve God. So this is the reason why I have certain shows I have because there has been no conversation, and for many of you watching, there still isn't any conversation surrounding any of these matters. And the only thing that we see 
are the sanctuary sucker videos, you know, the praise and worship yeah. leaders, videos like Kevin Terry. The only thing we see is the marriage is busting up, you know, and the ch one child here, one child yeah. there. That's all we see, but we're not having the conversation for healing. We're only t ha talking, having the it's conversation like for the exposure. And, and let's, let me just make one other caveat. If you listen to Paul's negativity around sex and sexuality, it tends to lead, for instance, in Romans 1, when he's making the observation of the Greco-Roman sex cult and, and the orgy, mm. right, that were accompanied with idol worship, which, by the way, they did do. They did have orgies and have um, and, and accompanied idol worship, and they spilled their seed into the earth and their uh, fluids into the earth so that the earth would bring forth fruit. It was a, a Greco-Roman uh, cult, cultish reality. When he had his observation around sex, like in that observation, or the observation that he had about it's best not to get married if you're going to you know, be a servant of Jesus Christ in, in the ministry, he, it means that he was uh, predisposed to thinking about it a lot too. Mm. It was on his mind. Mm. Because it showed up always negative. Mm. Get married if you if you have you burn it with love. Get married, but not because that because of, if if I'm dating you, brother, and I want to marry you, and you want to marry me, it shouldn't be just so that we can have sex. Mm. What an empty, loveless <laughs> desire that is. Ah. What is that? And but and why why is it? Isn't it because we want to blend our lives together and become something richer together than we could be individually? Mm. Sex notwithstanding. But yeah. that's the way that we look at it. And now, mind you, we want to take him literally, take Paul literally, mm -hmm. around this issue because we are not sex positive. We're sex negative most of the time. And, oh. and, and sex desperate. Uh, we are not. We are. Listen to that. We're. Li sex we're. Sex listen to that. I'm sorry, Yvette. We're not mm -hmm. sex positive. We are sex mm -hmm. negative. Now, and, th and I know that is the truth. I know that it is right because I yeah. look when I'm looking in my comments and I'm doing these shows, especially this week and last week when you got these guys. And I want you to speak to that um, later on. Um, we're gonna go to a break okay. about these guys that show up in the church having oral sex. And then the other videos that came out behind, I don't know if you guys saw them with other guys going to church, getting erected. I don't even know how they get erected in the church service in the side of the four walls of church. I just don't yeah. even know. But I just couldn't do it. But anyway, again, stand at the, al at the altar and erected and revealed themselves and then posted online. Uh, uh, in, the com in, the, in the comments, I saw people talking about the gay issue. I saw people talking talking about that. And to me, it looked like that a lot of people that were saying what they were saying about this stuff, there was something underlining that was negative yeah. about sex anyway. Because this, this is my yeah. thing. If you like the same sex and, or, and, and you are gay, if you're part of the LBGT community, yeah. I don't know why... I, I, I don't care that much. And, and, and if you care that much, to me, it says that you have this, I like the way you put it, this, this, you're not sex positive, you're sex negative, and not only that, you're not sex educated. You, 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 you're, right. you're, you don't have any education around sexuality because how is somebody else's sexuality mean so darn much to you? What is the problem? That's them, it's not you. <laughs> and, and let me let me let me say this that that mind you this whole thing about sex and the, the reason that I'm saying that it is such a big deal to us because we look for some kind of way to make the text and make Jesus and Paul and everybody else negative to this. Now we release Paul from his negativity about women preachers because there are too many of us now. <laughs> or praying without the hair covered, or not wearing gold jewelry, you know. We release Paul because he is slave positive, because that's why we don't preach from the book of Philemon. We don't mm. preach from it because we can't find any redeeming grace 
in his conversation with Onismus, you know, mm-hmm. we, I mean, about, uh, you know, Onismus. So we, so we don't have any, we release him from some of his negativity when he writes, but from this one, we hold him mm-hmm. as true because what we need is a negative hermeneutic. Uh, we need a negative vision of sex and sexuality because we've been led to believe that it is holy to be sex negative and not holy to be ethically sex positive. Okay. Ethically sex uh, positive. Uh, <laughs> okay, so go ahead, finish your statement. Eth- ethically sex positive. Finish that statement. Ethically sex positive. Because I think that when we begin with that as our hermeneutic, in terms of how we interpret what is the living and active word of God to us, we have to begin with removing all of this stuff about this nasty part of my body that's between my navel and my knee, <laughs> and somehow or other see that as also wondrously made. And you know what? And we have like to nasty. because if we if we don't see it like that, and see, I went, I I walked this this right here and out because see, my thing was sexual addiction and porn. I this right here, yeah. I know this. I walked this out. What you're saying is the absolute truth. Bishop Yvette Flunder, I don't bit more care you married to a woman. I don't care about what you believe <laughs> and, and or where we disagree. I focus on where we agree and what I can yeah. learn from you and what my viewers can learn from you. And this is a conversation that needs to be had. You are you are talking right because that's exactly and mind you, I was abused, I was raped, and all this different stuff. Now. I viewed my body between my navel and my knees, as you put it, as the part we do not discuss and don't not talk about. But I was so obsessed with it because it was a secret. And so that that really drove all of that sexual darkness and that pornobation yes. that I was doing all the darn yes. time. It wasn't until I because began to repression. Repression leads to obsession. Sir. Yeah, and and that repression. and and when I begin to say, okay, this is my body that God made. Sex is not bad. It made me honor. Yeah. It not just myself. I started honoring the women. I started honoring mm-hmm. everybody, and that made that was at the root of me stopping porn. Because I'm like, I'm watching these people remember, abusing their body. Remember this too, my brother. Remember this. There are somewhere between 6 and 8% of the population of any time in, in culture anywhere that are same gender loving. If we were to push the envelope to 10%, we could include probably our trans brothers and sisters and siblings. That means that the majority of human beings are heterosexual. They're not homosexual. Mm-hmm. or bisexual. Mm-hmm. But yet, when we talk about this, there's so much more conflama about saying gender-loving people as though that's the, the big sex issue. Mm-hmm. The, the big sex, sex issue of repression is far more evident mm-hmm. in the straight community mm-hmm. than it is in the gay community. Mm-hmm. For God's sake, and I think that the LGBT community being able to dish and, and, and destroy and, and debate LGBT community makes straight people who are out of control feel better. Mm. They, at least I'm not gay. You know, I may be this, I may be that, but, but at you're, least I'm not but gay. But you're sexually unethical. That's why I like what you said about the ethics Precisely. around the sex. Okay, so uh, this is going to be good good because I got a question. When I had Pastor McQueen up here, Bishop Trotter, there's a question I asked him, and I haven't been able to get an interview with Bishop O.C. Allen. I'm going to ask you. I want to understand what the sexual ethics look like in the same gender-loving community. Because I, I, I ain't seen it that much. But we're going to a break right now. After this break, we're coming back with the brilliant, the talented, the one that we will always love because of. Thank you. But now we're getting to appreciate her brain, her spirit, her energy, and who she is as a person. When we come back after this break, we're going to continue the conversation and find out what sexual ethics look like in the LBGTQ community. 
Are you in need of direction for a decision you have to make? Maybe you're curious about the future. If that's you, the founders of Zoe Ministries and the Company of Prophets are offering you free prophecy. Call 888-831-0434. Don't wait. Call 888-831-0434. Do it today. Life Guide service provides divine direction and insight for your life and future. Larry D. Reed specializes in spiritual guidance through prophecy, counsel, and dream interpretation. As he communicates with people, within minutes, Larry D. Reed begins to engage the spirit world, seeing and hearing things on their behalf that are vital, pertinent, and necessary for the success of their destiny. Having served thousands of people from all walks of life for over 20 years, Larry D. Reed has been and is the life guide. Book your appointment today. you just watch the advertisement for free prophecy if you need direction and insight for your life contact go to bishopjordan.com sign up to get your free prophecy and they will call you immediately and over to and over to during again get on your last nerves trying to shove this prophecy down your mouth lord jesus but they are a wonderful 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 group of prophets of course as you begin to support and give you start running into the master prophet who will um, send you a prophecy straight out of his mouth. And let me tell you, it's going to revolutionize your mouth. Um, did I say your mouth? Yeah. Your life. Lord have mercy. I, I, <laughs> I'm thinking about the next segment already. <laughs> already. And then also, of course, Life Guide. Sign up and someone will get with you as soon as possible. All right. We have Bishop Yvette flunder on the line with us and now we're about to go into the conversation um a part of the conversation i really want to understand i really want to know because i haven't been able to reconcile certain things i've heard and it's this um yvette what does se se the sexual conduct the sexual habit the, the ethics in the lbgt community from a christian standpoint how what is holiness? Mm -hmm. Can you talk to me about I that? Think this is, I think it's a very fair question. So let me, let me begin by saying this. I, I have the definition for me of a hermeneutic or, or your interpretation or your method mm -hmm. of understanding what we call the word of God and understanding God and God's nature mm -hmm. are the lenses through which you see God and the lenses through which you see scripture. Okay. I think we have to go in inwardly and first determine what is our hermeneutic? How do we really see God? How do we really see scripture? And that's the part that has to get healed first. Okay. Before you can start talking about ethical behavior. Okay. Ethical behavior, or ethical response to human sexuality, should begin with a with a Latin word prima facie. Your first face or prima facie duty to everyone, including yourself, is to do no harm. Okay. To do no harm. Okay. That is the holiest thing that we can ever do for ourselves or for anyone else is to seek to do no harm. So the first now, rule so the first no rule harm. so the first rule of sexual ethics in the LBGT community and this sounds like I, I would say for all of us for sexuality for for all of humanity is do no harm to yourself or others. It's the first rule for everything. Got it. Do, not just sex. Got it. As it relates to money? Got it. As it relates to business? Got As it. it relates to whatever it is that we do, we are, are responsible to do no harm. Got it. Okay. That's incredibly important. And, and we have to go back and heal our, our 
Christian belief system until it gets in line with that reality. There are people who do incredible harm in the name of Jesus. Ah. Uh. Incredible harm. Over and over again. Some of the rhetoric that I'm hearing politically right now is fueled by conservative evangelism and evan um, um, conservative, co very conservative ev evangelistic ideas mm -hmm. that suggest that God wants you to do harm. And where do they get that from? Mm. And I can go back and say to you that there is plenty of scripture evangelically uh, um, interpreted that suggests that God wants you to go into a land and kill everybody and take all their goods and stuff simply because God wants you to take over the land. Mm. The, the whole Old Testament is filled with lots of blood. Oh, Lord. And lots of blood netting and lots of sacrifices and it, just blood it, is everywhere. And it people, bet. It's, it's too people much. People want that. It's too much. That, but it's the truth. It's too, yeah, I know it is, but it's too much. But it is the truth. You're stretching us too quick. And it begs the question, it begs the question, if I want to be a slaveholder, there is scripture that says slaves obey your masters. We can't unsay that. It's in the text. Uh, that's just too much. It's just, you take, that's too much. Okay, let's just get back. Let's get, let me get back. Let's get back to the sexual. In the church. Let's it's get in the book. Let's get back to sexual ethics. That is, too, now you know that's too much. So, you know that's too much for us. I'm we can't take that today. <laughs> I'm saying it to you that if you have if you have a hermeneutic uh, for slavery, there is stuff in there for that. If you have a hermeneutic that women should be silent, there's stuff in there for that. That's why your hermeneutic has got to be healed. I have to undo the hermeneutic that I was taught and allow the Spirit of God to give me what is a basic fundamental hermeneutic to do no harm. Okay. What does the Lord require? Okay, hope, um, let, me, let me finish. Okay. What does the Lord require, Larry? Mm -hmm. But that we would do justly and love mercy and walk humbly before God. What did, what did Jesus say? The whole law and the prophets is encapsulated in this. That thou will love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as you love yourself. I had to get myself a hermeneutic of do no harm. Then I go back then to the text and go back to what is my responsibility. First, to my own body, because my first responsibility is my own body. Mm -hmm. To take care of my, and finally, after almost 50 years of my life, I decided to love myself. Mm. And I love myself, Larry. Mm. I love my whole body. Mm. Including what's between my navel and my knees. My, everything I have is good. Everything. <sighs> it's all good and it's all together lovely. All together is lovely. Now, listen, now hold all on. Now, now, you bet. Now, you then, bet. You, you need me to answer your question, so let me get the last sentence out. And so then <laughs> my responsibility is to love my neighbor. Okay. And to seek to do no harm. And once I came to that, there are certain things that I will not do to myself. There are things that I won't let you do to me. And there are things that I am not going to do to you. I'm just not going to. Because my whole vision of what God wants, Jesus said that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God be on earth as it is in heaven. That kingdom come that will be done on earth. As it is in heaven. Okay. How that, do I bring heaven to earth? Do you understand? I got it. That, I that's got it. what I believe. So when it begins there, and then that informs every sexual or non-sexual experience that you have in life. To what degree mm -hmm. am I doing harm? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because everything else has shifted and changed over time. <sighs> People, people say, but you have to have a biblical marriage. I say, no, you don't. You don't want a biblical marriage. You may think you want a biblical marriage, but I can promise you that you don't want a biblical marriage. We, no, we, nobody, nobody wants a biblical marriage. It's just, I don't care straight no, or gay. Just, 
Nobody wants a biblical they don't marriage. Want a biblical marriage. <laughs> they think they do because they think that what we do as marriage now is what happened in the first century AD. Well, it's not by any stretch of the imagination. And let let's, let me say something but about we, that. That's when, what we say. When I say Go that ahead. nobody wants a biblical marriage, let me say what I mean. Okay, you get married, and this particular person, for whatever reason, may have a, a be, they may go up and down the sexual spectrum depending on the, how, what the moon looked like, the sun looked like, what time of the year or whatever they're going through. And you're married to that. According to the Bible, you stay married. There is no divorce. You know, if even if they're hitting you upside the head, you stay married. There is no divorce when it comes to the biblications. You know, now what we have done in the church We've made it okay, you know, now to have four, five, six different um, marriages. We pull certain scriptures that we can divorce if we do this or if they do that. Now, that's what we have accepted as far as the church is concerned. But when I say nobody wants a biblical marriage, I'm talking about as far as the length and the breadth and, or the depth at which the Bible discusses marriage. It is a box. It is a very small box. And nobody can do no that. That just is, it's not real. Well, at the time of Jesus, at the time of Jesus, which is where we try to get our reference for the most part about biblical marriage, first of all, he never got married, at least as far as we know. But then the second thing I think that is important to say is that the role of a woman, you could still have multiple marriages, multiple women, and you could still, as a man, put your wife away for cause. Mm -hmm. You kept the children but you could put her away for yeah. cause, whatever that cause was. But here's the deal. If, if my father decided that I should marry you, my father would essentially sell me to you for a bride price. Absolutely. That's how we became betrothed. And, the, and then on the wedding night, if it was discovered that I was not intact, that my hymen right. was not still in place. If the sheep wasn't bloody. I could be stoned to death. Mm -hmm. I could be stoned to death. And the, and the marriage party often waited until the proof came down from the marriage bed that you and I had consummated the marriage and that I was a virgin. Exactly. If I was not a virgin, I could be stoned to death. And whoever it was that caused me to be not a virgin could be stoned with me at the gates of the city. Mm -hmm. Now, Biblical marriage. We don't want biblical marriage. We just what we've done is we've taken today's marriage and visited it on the text as though that is what they were doing as biblical marriage. And and I tell people you don't understand at all what it is that you're saying. It's just that it's become culturally true. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. literally true. It is culturally true. And, and there's and there's a, a book written by uh, Stephanie Kuntz, I think is her last name. It's called Marriage: A History. She's a straight woman, a theologian, who wrote the story of how marriage moved through time and shifted and changed and shifted and changed. That's why I go back to my premise. There will always be a cultural shift, yeah. a cultural shift from country to country, from yeah. time to time, from century to century. But the rule of doing no harm will not change. Yeah. So your original question to me is, what is holiness? For gay people, mm -hmm. what what was holiness for a slave couple, who people said were three quarters human, and they didn't believe that they could really get married. They just paired them up, mm. like they did uh, horses or cows. What was holiness? What was, what was well? It depended on the circumstances surrounding their lives, right? Okay. What is, what is, what, how do you define what is holiness when people don't think that you're really human? And those are our ancestors. Hmm. So what is holiness for gay people? Well, during the time when nobody believed that gay people could be in long-term monogamous relationships, people did a whole lot of doing what you can, where you can, and how you can. <laughs> and things shifted and changed over time. Now, Shirley and I have been together 35 years. Mm -hmm. My confession to you is that there's never been anybody else since the day that I decided and she decided that we were meant for one another by the will and word and work of God. 
Mm. Now, I'm not saying that to brag because I don't have I don't have uh, judgment about people who haven't had the experience that she and I have had. But we couldn't get married until we could get married. Mm. So what was our duty when we couldn't get married? When slaves couldn't get married, what what did they feel? What was the thing that informed what constituted a relationship for them? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the same thing is true for the LGBT community. And there is an aside right here, brother. And the aside is, when people have been in the wilderness too long, they can become wilderness oriented. Okay. Hmm. And when you haven't been able to have relationships, it's not within the realm of possibility for you to have relationships that may be saved. Then you've learned your whole sexuality in closets. Mm. It hurts. That's hurt. That's painful. And it's a hard habit to break. Even for people who want to break it, or even if they do want to break it. And I'm not assigning that to everyone. Mm -hmm. Because there's an ethical way to be sexual. Yeah. And again, you do no harm. You're mindful of underage people. You're mindful of Mm -hmm. exploitation. You're mindful as a preacher not to use your charisma and your power. Mm -hmm. To subjugate the people who follow you as the man of God or the woman of God. Mm-hmm. And not use their body. You're okay. mindful of that when you're mindful of doing no harm. Okay, so you... But you... the whole community, the whole community needs to be, all of us need to be saved from having lived our lives for years in the shadow. We're not shadow people. We are the greatest artists, the greatest musicians. The greatest interior decorators, the greatest hairstylists, in so many ways, that and the greatest, some of the greatest preachers and teachers are contained in this community with all of that oppression at the same time. It is an amazing reality, but it is, and we all know that what I just said is true. All it is, of us it is. It's absolutely the truth. And that's what I was going to say because I guess that answers my question. You said, number one, do no harm to no one, not to to yourself or to your brother. So that should, and really, and that sounds like God to me. Let me tell you why. It sounds like truth to me because truth is, and God is all in all at all times and spaces and places. That truth applies to us all. And with that yeah. truth, then I can readily see why the sanctuary sucker thing happened. The I can see yeah. why these videos are going viral, you know, from this one sending themselves masturbating to another man and he's married to a woman. I see why these men cheat on their, their wives. I see why they don't take care of their children, you know, that they're having by other yeah. women. I see why we have all these cases of these pastors messing with these children, you know, and running yeah. sex rings and all of the, if that yeah. that truth. If we can all, I mean, embrace that truth and make it a way that we live our life, this will be something that will heal yeah. our culture, not just the LBGT community, but it will just just the black community because we have got it wrong. Yeah. And we are we don't have We're any. Impressed. We don't have in yeah, and it's and yeah, you explained that too. It comes from our suppression and from being in the space that we were in this country, you know, from that that really just makes sense to me. I don't know what it does to the LR. And let me, let me let me give you one more piece of this, and that is that Utah is the state in the United States that has the largest um, participation in online pornography. Okay. Whoa. Per capita. Whoa. This is a Mormon state. This yeah. is a state that is, holds people to a huge responsibility for self-control. But I want to go back again and say <laughs> that repression leads to obsession. Yeah. And before long, people inhabit the closet. Back to your own testimony. Mm. People inhabit the closet because the closet becomes titillating. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of people that, that will never leave traditional church 
and conservative church because they have come to enjoy having a reality that the people don't know about. You know, there's, there's something titillating about sitting next to somebody who you just had last night and acting like you don't know who they are. And they're acting like they don't know who you are. And you still can have their aroma on your face. Mm. But you're sitting next to them pretending like you're strangers. There are people that are so practiced in that 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 it's going to be very difficult for them to think about having any kind of relationship that is long term. <laughs> and and we have spawned that reality primarily because it, it has become exciting to have that secret. It's become exciting. It's, it's become a way of life. It's, it's some, in some ways, the juice of why some people will never leave conservative. They're not going to leave. They love the pageantry of it. They love the secrets. They love the underbelly. There's something very powerful and exciting about that. But I would also say that it, is, it can become an addiction such that the preoccupation with it yep. is interrupt the flow of your creativity mm. and being able to have a certain kind of life. When, when your whole life is about catch and release, catch and release, catch and release, it's a preoccupation that can interrupt yeah. certain other things in your life that takes a certain amount of time and concentration. I hope that that makes sense and doesn't sound judgmental. No, it doesn't sound judgmental at all, and it makes a whole lot of sense. I mean, this is LRL. We, yeah. we, are, we are talking about yeah. what is happening in our world, and what you're saying for me is, is, is bringing us all to the plumb line, whether you are watching me same gender loving or you're watching me and yeah. you, you like the opposite sex. This is bringing That's us right. all to the plumb line, every last one yeah. of us. And this is the the conversation. And now this is the thing that um, Bishop Yvette is that, because I've had other same gender loving people on the show who are pastors and they have, they do not practice with, uh, allegedly, I'm going to say allegedly, but from the, the way they answer my questions, if you are the only person that I've had here that makes sense to me because <laughs> they didn't make any sense to me because it sounded like, Oh, we're just going to just live life and do whatever we do, whether it's in the back seat of a car, whether it is around the corner. And you're right, there is some stimulation when it comes to that whole secret world of doing anything, you know. Uh, but what you're saying to me brings us all to the plumb line. We have just got this purify ourselves we have got to heal ourselves <laughs> we gotta we gotta heal like you, i like the way you say heal our hermeneutics we got to we gotta heal yeah, and make sure that make sure that we're not addicted to the point at which we are not able to fully live out our purpose it, it is there's something very interesting about people having more confidence in you as a man of god because you are a man of god and I also want to say that you're a man of God who has a very pithy kind of opportunity to reach to, to people. And I don't have any criticism about that. Mm. I really don't. But I see you as a man of God. And I want to set that aside for a minute and say that as a man of God, if people will have more respect for you, if you come with somebody different each time, if you were a gay man, and you come at some, with somebody different each time, they'll have more respect for you than if they see you all the time with the same person. Hmm. They will condemn you if they see you all the time with the same person and say that you are an item and a couple and start giving you a hard time. But you can have somebody different every week, somebody different in every city that you go to, and you'll get more respect. Hmm. Hence, why is it that people then find themselves in, in catch and release, catch and release, catch and release reality. Some of it is because that's the way they can move through the church. Mm. The church has created what the church condemns. Oh my God. What? In which the is world? an interesting dynamic. That's an interesting dynamic. 
So if you want to have a real relationship, you're less allowed to do that than you are allowed to catch and release all over the United States and world. Wait a minute. That's a, that's a, do you understand what I mean? I get it. I fully 100% you, get it. Do you hear me, man of God? Do I listen. you understand me, man of God? <laughs> <laughs> I get this, you know, and and I, and so you, I'm 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 gonna say this. I'm gonna say it in a way that where everybody can understand me and just the way that my brain processed it. I can respect. God knows I can. I can respect a same gender loving person that is a Christian, you know, that prays and love God. I can respect you, knowing that you live holy, that you ain't out there. What's that um place that um. On Peach Street, you on Peach Street, uh, finding you a different person every single night. You run into to the clubs. You uh, you own every app there is. You having sex all all the darn time. You know, to me, whether you straight or gay, to me that ain't the life that uh, an adult good American citizen should be living. Now, now, it may be totally judgmental. I may be totally biased, and I do realize that, and I am aware of that. But to me, I just don't, I don't see that as you trying to live your best life. You know, but if you, whether straight or gay, are practicing some form of standard of what they want to call the holiness or ethics, there you go. Just use the word we've been using. Some yeah. form of e- ethics. No harm to yourself. No harm. No harm to others. I I, res- I respect that. You know, I highly I highly respect I, I highly respect you. You got with your wife. Stay with your wife. They ain't y'all not in adultery. You know, ain't y'all still together and faithful partners. Hey. I cannot like it and throw scripture after scripture after scripture or not agree with it. I can I can just throw every scripture possible at it. But I don't, I'm like, you know, that's really nice. Y'all, you're know, taking care of each other and you're committed to each other and you're loving God and helping people. Oh, this is the thing I wanted to, um, it done popped in my mind. Um, the HIV, Carton told me that you have held people their last breath that people that have contracted, yeah. contracted HIV who are the children of some of the saints and these bishops and, and stuff. Talk to me about that. Well, it's true. I mean, I have, uh, there was a time that the ambulances would not come and get people because they had HIV and the ambulance people were afraid. And, and it's true, I have literally uh, picked up people uh, because we had the first HIV housing for a faith-based organization here in the Bay Area. Mm. And uh, particularly for children, the children of the saints. They were black children and children that were, were you know, Kojic children and uh, Baptist children. And I remember one boy in particular, he had lost weight down to almost 90 pounds. And he was very, very sick. And I called and the ambulance wouldn't come. So I picked him up, literally, and put him in my, the back seat of my car and drove him to the emergency and t- took him in uh, to emergency because I had to carry him. And I sat him down in a chair, and they were taking his blood pressure, and the nurse said, his blood pressure is flat. Mm. And he looked at me, and I looked at him, and I watched his pupils fix and dilate while he was looking at me. And he died while I was looking at him, sitting in the chair. Mm. And that wasn't the only experience that I've ever had. I uh, had a, a lot of dying beds to make up, uh, people whose needles and, and tubes, uh, the nurses wouldn't take them out, but I wanted the tubes to be out before their, their, uh, before their families came and saw the body. Um, you know, had, had a lot of experiences, and my former husband also died from complications from HIV mm. and um, wasn't given a funeral. But um, I think it's important for me to say that um, I've watched enough dying not to be afraid of the living, if you understand. Mm. I have walked enough people all the way to hand, put their hand in the hand of God in full assurance of faith. That's why, you know, my haters don't have any real impact on me mm. because they haven't experienced what I've experienced. They don't know what I've been through. And I'm about trying to bring life, not condemnation. I'm trying mm-hmm. to help a people who have been marginalized for years and years 
and uh, engage sometimes in self-defacing and self-abusing behaviors because of what they've been through. And I'm trying very hard to mm. help people shift their hermeneutic first about how they love themselves and how they see themselves and theologically and spiritually, trying to move them to their, their greatness mm. and away from suicide, slow or fast, because there's such thing as slow suicide, too. Mm. where you can eat yourself to death and sex yourself to death and mm. there's all sorts of things and drug yourself to death. There are things that, that come from feeling oppressed and thrown away. And there's a huge percentage of young people who are turned out by their families and thrown away by their families because they're gay. And they come, many of the saints' children, and they come to California as a place to be. Mm -hmm. And we've established housing for young adults for that reason. And the whole purpose is to try to get them to see themselves the way that God sees them. You know, gay is not on the list with drug addicts. Gay is on the list with race. You mm -hmm. are who you are because you are who you are. And whether you do something or not with it, it is who you are. And to help people to uh, understand that and to know that and to realize that and to stop hating themselves, my prayer is that we will stop the large percentage of young adult suicides yeah. that come from gay children who are hearing messages of self-hatred, uh, often in Christian environments, and are hating themselves. And so I want all of them to know. I don't want them to hear my heart about this. Gay is not something to kill yourself about. Mm. Mm. Gay is, is, is any more than being black is. Yeah. That's not something to kill yourself about. It is not. And that you can be full and you can be whole and you can live a life, uh, an ethical life. You can live a good, healthy, and solid life and contribute your gifts and skills to humanity and be a same gender loving person or a trans person or gender non conforming person or a queer person or whatever it is that you call yourself or sense yourself to be. Hmm. And God loves us. And I have said to God, when I argued with God, brother, about calling me to ministry, I argued. I said, well, how in the world am I going to be called to ministry with everything that is basically being circulated in the air about who I sense myself to be? Hmm. And I heard God speak to me again. I knew who you were when I called you. Hallelujah. Mm. Glory to God. Mm -hmm. I knew who you were when I called you and I chose you. And I understand that now. At almost 65 years old, you know, I really understand, you know, I understand now that I am called for, by God for such a time as this. And I want these children to stop living dangerously. I want them to stop overdosing on drugs. I want them to stop committing suicide simply because someone has made them feel that they are a nasty piece of gum on the bottom of God's shoe. Some, you know, that is not who they are. And I encourage, I'm going to, I gave you one book about, boy, about um, human sexuality and marriage. Mm -hmm. Stephanie Kuntz's book, which I think is very important. It's called Marriage of History. Mm -hmm. But there are a couple more. There's one that talks about pre-colonial -co pre sexuality on the continent of Africa. It's called Boy Wives and Female Husbands. And it's Ooh. written by Will Roscoe and Stephen Murray. Boy Wives and Female Husbands. I encourage husbands. people. Yeah, Boy Wives and Female Husbands. Mm. And some of the folks who want to know something about gender identity and sexuality, one of my dear friends, uh, Dr. Reverend Dr. Virginia Mollencott, M-O-L-L-E-N-C-O-T-T, -T, wrote a book called Omnigender, O-M-N-I-G-E-N-D-E-R. Right. She's also clergy, by the way. And I encourage people, read and study. Don't just pick up what has been the old wives' tale about things. Know something about your own reality, your, your gender and gender orientation, which, by the way, is not the same as your sexual orientation. 
Okay, Understand your gen- your gender orientation. your gender orientation and your sexual talk a little bit about that because people are being educated. That's not the same thing. Okay, first of all, the gender spectrum is very long. This idea that men are from Mars and women are from Venus is a lie. You know, men all men are not some way and all women are not some way. And then you get the folks that kind of live in the middle, like me. You know. I'll, I'll fry your chicken and change your oil, too. You understand what I'm saying? Uh. <laughs> I, live, <laughs> I, live in, I live in both of those worlds from the standpoint of what is typically stereotypically male or stereotypically female. Right. But most human beings have been pushed into a, a space, but that's not necessarily where they are because of how their bodies are made. So your, your gender orientation or what you feel yourself to be in terms of gender, where you are on that spectrum, mm. is not always uh, in agreement with where you are in terms of your sexual orientation. Mm. And then we have several different realities. There are human beings that are born with both genitalia at the same time. Yeah. That we call, we used to call hermaphrodites. Now we call inter- people. Okay. In, in, intersex people, and then, right? Then there are people. Then there are people who have like Schwier syndrome, or a woman who she's born with female genitalia, but she comes to the time pubescent time when she's supposed to have menstruation, and breasts are supposed to develop, but that never happens. Mm. And then there are several different degrees of that reality, of those realities. Essentially, we are not binary. We are not either or. The whole human family is more like both and. Some of this and some of that. Both in terms of orientation, in terms of sexuality, in terms of gender, in terms of gender identification. Uh, Why we have transgender people, and we do have transgender people who, like men who are sense themselves to be women, they enjoy sex and the role as women, but they never dress like women. They never put on the stuff like women. You know, it's, it's, there are all sorts of, like, all sorts of realities that exist. We would do better to learn more. And to these children whose parents are throwing you away, please, if you are hearing us on this broadcast, look us up and let's talk. And to the parents who, like my parents, had to endure the the way in which your communities and churches made small of you because your child was gay or transgender, because our parents are forced into a box and, and thought of as it. deficient oftentimes. Yes. And I need the parents to know that we owe you a debt of gratitude in the mm. places and spaces where you affirmed us sometimes at the loss of some of your friends and family members. Yeah, that's true. And God bless them. And God bless every one of you for your strength and for the ways in which you prayed and the ways in which you loved your children who were different in terms of how people perceive them. God bless you. And we owe you and we need to thank you more because when we came out, we forced you out and you didn't intend to have to come out. Oh, wow. Yeah, very true. And we owe you. We owe you a debt of gratitude, every one of them that made it. My sainted mother, who has passed into the presence of God, who became my champion before she died. I, every time I look in the mirror and I see her face, I thank God for my mother. Mm. I just thank God for her. Just the very thought of her. I thank God for my mother. And I promised her that I would defend the fact that parents struggle yeah. because of the realities yeah. of their children. Yeah. That's an important part of it. That's deep. So there are books to read, and it's, there's PFLAG that's out there, Parents and Friends of Lesbians and Gays, PFLAG, that welcomes parents to come and receive strength. And for children that are contemplating suicide, there's a project called the Trevor Project, P-R-E-V-O-R, because... Suicide is the second leading cause of death now for young people between 10 and 24. Mm -hmm. And LGBT youth are eight times more likely to have attempted it 
because they have been rejected by family. Mm. Please get the help that you need. Know that Bishop Plunder and the Fellowship of Affirming Ministries is, a, is created in the United States, in Mexico, several countries in Africa, parts of Asia. We are in many, many places now, and we have churches in many, many places that are affirming of people who are HIV positive, people who are LGBT, and their parents, and folks that just want to be in a community that receives everyone. Mm -hmm. We are organized. For that reason, one of one of the things. And we still we still shout and speak in tongues. I know that's and right. We like a we like a B three organ <laughs> and a full drum set and tambourine. So I just need to know we still are who we are. Oh, uh, what I was gonna what I was gonna say or well, let me just say this. Um, one of the things that I want to do here on LRL and. You know, I often yeah. say, I say this is not a Christian show, but I am a Christian because I will interview yeah. and talk to any and everybody. And I'm, I got some plans yeah. to do some great things even before the turn of the year. And I want to be the, the kind of person that's open hearted to everybody. And I am. I don't yeah. even try to, I don't even yeah. really have to try. It just, and if I'm not open hearted, it's like God put, taking me on a, a journey to teach me a lesson and show me myself and then once I yeah. you know learn that lesson that part of my heart open. And so there's something that is that about you and on you that sort of drew me to you that created this moment. I've always paid attention to yeah. you. I've always thought about you. You've always been in my mind. So I think that this is a, a very special moment and what you said today really opened up my eyes even the more about um, us as a community, also the church, yeah. the conversations that we need to have. Today's topic is the church in the closet. And because the church yeah. is in the closet, and I'm not talking about just gay people, because the church is in yeah. the closet across the board about sexuality, we have all of the yeah. manifestation of this stuff that is going on in the black community and in the church. And the rule right. of thumb that you gave for us as it relates to sexual ethics just really clears everything up and really should make us be have a moment of sobriety and look at ourselves and be like, look. I know we arguing the Bible, yeah. we arguing should women do this, we arguing gays and all that, but um, let's just get to the to the root of things. We are not sexually yeah. ethical, and we are unethical. Yeah. Period. I mean, I'm, for, yeah. and, yeah. And, and 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 it's horrendous. And we're supposed to be representing God and the church and the world, and we are terribly unethical. Man, that just yeah. hit. That just hit home for me. I'm like, damn, we, we screw it up. It's true. And we're taught to be. <laughs> and, and, and may may I leave you with one thing, just just from my heart to your heart, because I thank God in so many ways that you've come through what you've come through. Mm. Be because mm. the, the wilderness and desert teach us things yeah. that we can't yeah. learn unless we go through something and come out on the other side. That's just yeah. really the truth. And I sat at a table with some great preachers mm. not long, well, some years back, who, if I called their names, you would know every one of them. <laughs> and while we were talking, they were planning a trip to go to South America where the age of consent is 14 years old. Yeah. And all of them were planning this trip, and they allowed me into the conversation about where they were going. and what I've, they were been, going I've been in the conversation. I know exactly what you're talking about. You know about this. Yeah. And they were going to this, and they were going to that, and they were going to this. And in the course of that conversation, I asked the question. I said, so... Number one, all of them were to the person married. I said, do your wives know that this happened, that you go away and do this? I got several answers. Some of the answers were things like, I pay the rent, I, I pay the house note, I pay the car note, she better not say nothing to me about nothing. Um, I got responses like, we have an understanding, you know, and I need this release, and I need this and that. And, and so then I said, the young people that you have when you go to these countries who are 14 years old and such, are they aware that you're a man of God? Do they know about that? 
And they said, well, no, you know, essentially that they kind of shed that when they get to these countries and when they do the things that happen in these countries. And so I got down to the other piece. I said, so what would you do if when you came back you found that your wife also used that time that you were gone to engage in some things that were proclivities for her? How would you feel about that? And, of course, they, almost to the person, they said, she better not, essentially, with the heart and soul of it. So I said, so we have a combination here of some degree of child abuse, mm. some degree of, of undressing your, your self as a man of God when it's convenient to do that, and some degree of patriarchy in terms of your standard for her is different than your standard for yourself and for your brother. All of that from some of the highest ranking uh, preachers yeah. in our community yeah. that I know of. Now, how do we have an ethic that we can agree on if there are these cognitive people who have an ethic? Do you understand? I get it. That does harm perpetually. Ugh. If we don't pull Man. the cover essentially off of the fact that this group of people or people like this are not in a position to nail gay people to the cross. And some of their activities were going to be gay. But then publicly, they use their pulpit Man. to talk about gay as though it's something other than mm. what they were going to do, Bruh. which which I find remarkable. So that's why we got to have my precious brother. Well, see, I'm just they finding all this out, though. I'm... I'm just finding this out. It's but true. I didn't know All that. Of what I said yeah, once you true. that's why I'm going through changes in this it's chair true. because it is the absolute truth. I have been to the conversations. I true. I've read the emails back and forth and some cases that, that that I have already done and the receipts had to come to where they I have seen the emails setting it up in Thailand, setting it up in these different um, countries to be with I'm the mama and I the daughter. Yeah. Yeah, you telling Every the truth. Year. Every year, every year, as, as though they're going on a vacation or a retreat. Yes. And, and what I'm saying to you is that we need to have a cover-pulling, healthy, grown folk conversation about ethics. And we cannot continue to look to the very poor reality of human sexuality that we try to pull from the text. We have too much science now. We have too much, too many teachers. We have too many theologians. There are just too many ways that we can do this and do this well. If we were, will stop trying to create secret societies to, to accommodate our own flesh. Something has to happen because we are killing our children. That video that you're talking about, at, from what I have understood, is a boy. This is a young man. What is our duty to him? Mm. What is our duty? I'm, I am somebody's mother and grandmother. What is my duty to him? Mm. I, don't, I don't want to talk about how spurious it was that it was a bishop's chair. More has been done in bishop's offices than will ever be done in that chair. <laughs> What is my duty to that boy? I have a responsibility. He didn't come into the knowledge of that overnight. Mm -mm. Who trained him? Who took him? Where did he learn? Who is culpable and responsible? Where's the, the silent grown person? Mm. We have a duty to him and to every one of these young people to help them to think in a positive way and to help them to find a spirituality that does more than condemn the end result of somebody else's abuse. Mm. We can do better than this. And we must do better than this. We are obligated. I have grandsons. Do you know that? I have grandsons. Mm. Mm. I have grandsons. And I do not ever want to see my grandson subjected to some foolishness like this. That's crazy. That's crazy. But I have to teach them. 
and I have to keep a can of a killer Negro in my <laughs> purse all the time. <laughs> I know that's right. So let people know you, you will leave my children alone. Or it's going to be me and you, and I'm going to get some <laughs> Vaseline, take my rings off. It's going to be me and you. <laughs> I want them to come into their sexuality, whatever it is, mm-hmm. in a way that is logical and peaceful and loving and self-affirming. Wow. I want them to come into their sexuality. Doesn't matter to me where it, where it falls, where it lands. But they shouldn't be coming into it in a closet or 14 years old in the Caribbean somewhere with some mm-hmm. preachers. That's not the way it should happen. It should not happen that we owe these young people more than preaching against gays in the pulpit and be, we're beating the people up. Where's the positive thing? And so all these mamas and daddies out there that need to talk who, because you can sense something in your children. I can tell you a mother knows from the very beginning. Oh, yeah. When you know, you know. Then we need to talk about it. Let's talk about it and see if we can do some things to help our kids. Ugh. I love you, brother. Listen. I love you, you with the love of Jesus. You, you have and taken- thank you for the bold. Yeah, you have taken this. You t- you've taken this time and really put us in a world of thought and clarity, and probably have given a whole lot of people some direction, especially the parents and the loved ones of same gender loving people. For me, you are the go to and you are the rule of thumb when it comes to understanding what it is to be a same gender loving person who is walking with God and have ethics. I mean, I mean, you really just made it really clear. We got some work to do. There are people in the comments tomorrow, Larry, why don't why didn't you have somebody else on the other side to debate? There's no other side to what she is saying. When you look at the crux and the root and the core of what she's saying, be ethical, be honest, bring no harm. We are fucking oh, excuse me. I don't know how much you know about um Larry Live, but oh, I got yeah, some I fake I got some fake cuss words. But we are screwing yeah. this up. This is all, this is, this fucked up to the high heavens. This is all screwed up. Every story I have covered, you can take what she has, what she has said and measure the level of, and the thing she said about the Thailand thing, I mean, the other countries, that's true. I couldn't even bring that receipt. I have seen that. Man, it's all, it's just messed all the way up. Hopefully, what was said today, some preacher will hear, some young person will hear, some parent will hear, and this will be the beginning of a change of behaviors. Thank you so much, Bishop Event. Can we end with a word of prayer? Oh, absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. And I want to say to folks who know me, you know that I've been on many, many panels, and I've had to talk to folks and, and debate, debate, you know. I've had to defend my own dissertation. Mm. I really do understand that there are all sorts of views, but I hope that at the end of the day, if it ends in healing without yeah. hatred and condemnation and it sets people free, that that's what it is that we are really looking for. So if we can just end with a word of prayer, if you'll yeah. allow me to do that. Definitely. Go ahead. Gracious God, by all of your many, many names and all of your beautiful and magnificent manifestations. We give you honor and praise for this opportunity that we have had online to touch spirits with one another. I pray that we will find common denominators and common good and that we won't have to spend an enormous amount of time and energy trying to determine who is right and who is wrong. And what we will do is look for a love rubric, and an ethic that does no harm. Mm. I pray, oh God, that you'll forgive us for the ways in which we have used religion as a battering ram and a way to destroy and to diminish people, much like the Pharisees sought to diminish the publican. I may be wrong, but at least I'm not as wrong as you are. Mm. Help us now to move away from comparing ourselves to ourselves. And help us, O oh God, to embody the love that you have given us that was unconditional, hallelujah, hallelujah, and carried with it the kind of ability to see ourselves the way that you see us. 
Heal our community, I pray. Heal our community. Heal the healers so that the healers can heal. Mm -hmm. Heal our community, O oh God. And bless this man of God who had the courage to invite me and folks perhaps like me into conversation. Bless everything that he touches. Cause him to prosper physically, mm -hmm. financially. Mm -hmm. Cause him to be lifted up into what you really have called him to do. And because you are faithful, hallelujah, and there is nothing that exists that is greater than you, we call these things into existence in the strong and powerful name of Jesus. Jesus. And in the name of all that is pure and all that is right and all that is holy and all that is divine. And we declare that it is so. Amen. Amen. And praise God. I love you, honey. You call I, me anytime. Yeah. All, all right. I got that cell number. I, I ain't going to wear it out, but if I need it, I'm sure going to get you the text. You got the real number. You call <laughs> me. I love you. Take care now. Love you, too. All right, Angel. All right, bye -bye. Bye. Look at that. Did you hear what she said? I'm going to open up the lines just for a few. I, you got six minutes to call in. So if you can get into this, this line, put a number up there. If you can get into the line in the next six minutes, you got one minute to say whatever you want to say. You got six minutes to get in the line. I'm going to start taking the calls right now. Who, have we got another commercial break? Hosanna Baba College. Okay, now if you listening to me and you a preacher and you didn't understand half the words she was using, it's because you need to go to school and go to a real school. I got one that you need to sign up for. Go to the website and go ahead and get in there before September or August when it starts. And you can you know, get your Pell Grant. Go ahead and get your paperwork filled out because you can go on a school loan because it's a real school. When I come back, I'm going to start taking your phone calls. Go ahead and call right now, 646-787-8174. I'll be right back. Hosanna Bible College is on the move. We are an institution of higher learning, providing a quality theological and professional education for traditional students and working professionals. Hosanna degree offerings are Bachelor of Theology, Bachelor of Modern Music Ministry, Master of Christian Education, Master of Christian Counseling, Master of Divinity, and Doctor of Ministry. And yes, Hosanna Bible College offer degrees online. Just ask about the Bridge Program. You can enroll by calling 844-422-4968, extension 1001, or by visiting atl.hosannabc.net. All right, go ahead and enroll. If you are a church leader, you need to be degree to go ahead and sign up for Hosanna Bible College. All right, the lines are open. I'm taking your calls. You have one minute. Make sure that you're not playing your device in the background because that creates a whole branch of noise on this side. So make sure that you turn it down and just start listening to the show through your phone so when I call your name and the last four of your number, you can um, begin the conversation. All right, let's go. Caller ending in nineteen zero seven. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, hey, what's up, Larry? Uh, hey, I'm on Larry. Hello. What up? What up? Hey, what's up, man? Hey, I'm church famous now. I'm on your show now, bro. Hey, <laughs> to God be the glory. <laughs> on her, hallelujah. <laughs> What's up? My name is Solomon. I'm calling from uh, I'm calling from Los Angeles, California, man. Okay. All right. So I just want to say about um, the church, especially the black church, have an identity crisis with sexuality that mm -hmm. the white church does not. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what's going on is not just sexual proclivities, but the church have low self esteem, mm -hmm. and a lot of church people have low self esteem. And for me, most people who are sexually active in church are more attractive than those who are non-sexually active. And those who are non-sexually active have an opinion because don't nobody want them with Jesus. So that's why they are, every time you turn around, they're judging somebody, they're talking about somebody. Um, it's always a problem. But my thing is sexuality, the Bible, the first commandment God ever gave to anybody in the Bible, he said, be fruitful and multiply. Okay. In other words, he said, go out and, and what you say, frock. He said, go 
It said about ways and the highways and, and fuck. Fuck okay, everybody. You know, just be like, get it out the way, Jesus. That's what he told him. But, you know, he, you know, that was the oh. first commandment in the Bible. So after that, we start putting standards in our sexual behavior. What you need to do, you need to do this. But to me, what comes out of you naturally that's something that people need to have a conversation about. Now, for me, I was a virgin. I, I grew up in the church my whole life. I was a virgin until I was 24. And the reason I was a virgin until I was 24 seconds. is I'm like, okay, God going to, you know, deliver me from any uh, sexual addiction or anything, sex, mm. you know, sexuality and all these things. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and you, prob you person, probably saw, I watch. like I was saying, you saw sexuality. Hello? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I hear you, okay. bro. Just saw sexuality, you know, as evil altogether, and that's and that's what I had to be set free and delivered from. And the and the moment. Because that's the label we put. We, that's what the label we put on even our kids. Like sixty seconds. Out, black family, if you find out your kids have sex, you condemn them immediately. And I say, mm. hey, you know, this is natural. My mama had sex at sixteen. My grandma had sex at eighteen. Like it's na it, it's natural to, to have. I mean, it's natural. It's a human nature. It's a nature thing. It's in nature. Yeah. And and so, uh, you know, I, I was I holding out, waiting for God to, to do this for me. And then uh, the number one person I would watch was Juanita Bynum. I used to love Juanita Bynum, bro, like, because I felt like she was the example of holiness. And um, she always preached about holiness. Then when I turned 26 or 27, I heard her on a podcast talking about doing the height of her ministry she was sucking dick and eating pussy. I'm like, so you telling me to live? <laughs> wait, like, wait, wait, hold on a minute. Ten you seconds. Your own wait, thing, bro. wait, like, wait, how, wait a minute. How, on how the show, we rich. say peen and we say puss. But oh, I know, you know what? I know what you're sorry, talking I'm about. Sorry. I got, you know, a, uh, I got eight it's all right. I'm just I'm messing. Sorry. You good? But so, you, you right. She did say that. She did say that. She did say that. Right. So my thing is, and and the church is a whole condemnation of gay men, but it's more lesbians and more bisexual women in the church than anything, and they the ones who have the biggest stuff to say. But my thing is, that's something when it comes to sexuality and closing. That's Okay, Kenda knocked you off. He said, well, you one minute. I'm telling everybody, 646-787-8174. I don't want you to be hung up on, but Kenda Finger and his nervous system is bad. It's bad. And he's going to hit that X. All right, let's go to the next caller. Caller in at 9626. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Larry, it's Tamika from Omaha, Nebraska. Hey, Tamika, you got a nice singing voice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Larry, 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 in my one minute, Okay. there's a lot to cover. Okay. Okay? Now, while I appreciate the diversity of topics, I myself am kind of a hippie person, mm -hmm. but, er, um, like you say. But, um. Uh, but Tom, <laughs> this is what happens when, you know, we live in America. Mm -hmm. Sex is a very central topic in America. America prides itself on being, you know, about sexual freedom, the sexual revolution. Mm -hmm. So what has happened is in the church, even the Christian church, we have placed sex as central. Mm -hmm. So everything is surrounding sex and everybody wants to point the finger you doing this kind of sex you doing that kind of sex you doing that kind of sex and then they want to perpetuate the lie that jesus never addressed sex or homosexuality or any of that i would like people to go to matthew chapter 5 and matthew chapter 18 on their own time to look at what jesus addresses Sexually, It doesn't matter, though. Jesus is a part of the Godhead, and he was there when God said what abominations there were. Now, the young man who just spoke and said the first commandment was about, you know, being fruitful and multiplying, mm -hmm. I need him to go back and look at the discussion about the tree, okay? We had our first commandment was about the tree. Right. But, you know... You know, that's okay. That's neither here nor there. Everybody in the church needs to go to seminary, first of all. Uh, and there are so many pastors who, 
I'm sorry, Larry, and there are pastors who have not. Okay? Mm-hmm. And they're leading with their private parts. Yeah, it's they need, ridiculous. Yeah, they need to the go to Bible the college. The church's responsibility. Yeah. The church's responsibility is for those who recognize their sin the way God sees it, come into the church, desire to change, rely on the precious Holy Spirit to change, and be consistently discipled, hmm. okay? I hear that. You're not to come into the church and, and be gay or be whatever. And gay is not the, you know, one. It's all sexual immorality. Okay. They're not flying a flag for adultery. <laughs> I appreciate you though, Larry, and and the exposure you do give to things. I really and I'm praying for you. Please pray Thank for me you. and my family. Love you. Thank you so very much for contributing to the Confidence Station chat, Lito. All right, call it in in the eight zero two eight. What's your name? Where you calling from? Hello, my name is Ray, and I'm calling from Dallas, Texas. All right. I, I'll be brief. I want to say, Larry, thank you so much for opening this conversation. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know Bishop Lunder personally was with her just last week, spent lots of time. She is the real deal. So what you see in here, uh, I can I can testify. She really is the real deal. One of the things that uh, I wanted to add to the conversation, I am a same gender loving person. I spent many, many uh, years. I, I almost said I wasted many years mm. struggling. And when you are suppressing something, it does lead to obsession. And I too, in prayer, at I think 21, 22 years old, was married with children by that point, mm. married to a woman that is, uh, praying and begging and heard God say to me, uh, or, or it dawned on me, that God had never said anything to me about my sexuality. And I knew I could hear the voice of God. I had proven uh, that I could hear God's voice. And it dawned on me, God has never said anything to me about this. Uh, People have said something to me. The church has said something, society. But of all the things God has spoken to me, God had never said anything to me. And what really set me free, uh, Bishop Blunder was talking about our hermeneutics, is that we in the church have developed into uh, worshipers of the Bible instead of worshipers of God. Mm, interesting. Uh, I, was in, I went to seminary, I'm a minister, I went to seminary and I was in a seminary course and I was on some tangent talking about the word of God. You got to have the word. If you don't have the word, you don't have anything. You got to have the word. And one of my classmates came up to me afterwards and said, have you ever considered that the Bible contains the Word of God, but it is not the Word of God. And I looked at him. This was a, a white classmate of mine. And I think you must be crazy. What are you talking about? Of course the Bible is the Word. He said, what does it say in the book of John? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And if you read on down, it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among them. He said, Christ is the Word. The Bible is a book. It contains the word, so you study to show you thyself approved. You pray for discernment and for revelation, but the Bible is a book. It's a book written by men about mm-hmm. God. Yeah, agreed. Uh, that absolutely set me free. And mm-hmm. I saw a lot of this. If our religion or our spirituality or our faith is connected to bigotry or hating someone or marginalizing any group, then we need to check our faith. Gotcha. Because I can't find God in that at all. Hmm. But thank you for opening the conversation. Bless you. And thank you so much for contributing to the conversation. Kendall, let you hug up for I have to tell them to tell you thank you. I won't tell the man thank you, darn. All right, let's go. Caller in and then six zero five seven. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, Mr. Larry, how are you today, sir? I'm I'm doing good. My name is Good. My name is Michelle, and I'm just calling from Oakland, California. But I was calling because I know I heard everything that she said, and we are not to judge anyone. But my thing is, how do you just get in the pulpit? And I'm not just not to talk about her. Mm-hmm. And we preach one thing about being saved and living right, but then we live our lives the way that we live, and we try to make that as that that's right too. Mm-hmm. So. Where in the Bible does it say that we can live any way and still be okay and make it into heaven? I just want to know where in the Bible does it say sin is it's okay to sin? Because mm-hmm. sin is sin. Mm-hmm. So to me, it becomes double standard. Because mm-hmm. you can't preach and tell me, oh, 
be saved and, and live right and do this right, but then we live the way that we live and we think that that's okay. Where is it that that's okay? Hmm. If you can, if somebody can tell me in the Bible where it says that it's okay to sin, have sex, be gay, do it all, then I'll understand it better by and by. But to me, <laughs> that's double standards. Mm-hmm. I hear because you. we can, if we're gonna take God for His word, then we take God for His word. We can't take out of His word and make it apply for this time, for such a time as this. Mm-hmm. But Tomorrow, it's a whole different story. You know, you, I mean, mm-hmm. how do you do it? The Bible says double, double-minded, unstable in all his ways, mm-hmm. like a two-headed dragon with a, walking around with his head cut off. That's double standard to me. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. I understand. Because what you gonna make I, me believe that you gonna make me believe that it's okay to be gay. You gonna make me believe that it's okay to just go around and have sex, and that God is okay with that. And like that man said, yeah, it's a book, and yes, it is a book, but it was written, and we walk into believing that book. So now, I, what, we don't believe it no more? Yeah, I don't, I, this is my thing. Like I tell people on the show, believe the book, practice the book, believe and do whatever you do. If it worked for you, it worked for you, great. I don't think um, Bishop Yvette Flunder or anybody in the comments or that will ever come on the show, um, I don't think, well, I, mm-hmm. don't, I don't know, but I don't think that anybody's trying to get somebody to change what they believe. I think the conversation is all about Mm -hmm. everybody understanding what everybody else is saying about what they believe and respecting what they believe. Mm -hmm. We don't, we don't have to embrace it at all. We don't have to change our beliefs at all, at all. You know, it's just a matter of just hearing where they're coming from and being like, okay, I can still disagree. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that that was what her goal was. Although I do know some people that is their goal. Yeah. Right, because then you you live the we we live the way that we live, and and I'm gonna end it. We live the way that we live, and we live gay. We live having sex, so we're supposed to live that way the rest of our lives and think that it's okay. That mm. that's what I'm saying. Gotcha. You know? So I get that. And they say when you know better, you do better. So mm. at what point do you take God for His word and want to change? Mm. My That's thing, my, my, yeah, I got yep. you. Well, thank you so much for calling. Um, thank my, you, Le- That You cut off what she could tell me to thank you. What nigga? I'm going to say this, though. Um, the whole thing, when you get into talking about living by the book, I'm going to keep it real. I, there's certain things I believe, and they do come right up out the Bible. And, and it ain't just because the Bible said it. It's because of in, in my living you know, I just choose to live that way. Hey, and it is what it is. You know, but I'm not going to ever be one of the kind of people where the Bible said it, so you're going to live it. Because, although I respect anybody that said, because the Bible said a lot of stuff, I'm just not going to live. I'm just not going to, I'm I just am not. Hell, I'm sitting here divorced. So I'm, I'm divorced. I'm in sin. According to the scriptures, according to the biblications, I am in sin, and if I get married to somebody else, y'all trying to put me with Andrea, you're trying to put me with all different kind of the, uh, the the guests and other people y'all see. But if I decide to get married again, then I'm I'm I got second marriage. Then I'm I'm in sin again. I'm in adultery, you know. So I'm never going to be the kind of person that be like, well, the Bible said it. This is me personally. The Bible said it, and that settles it. Mm-mm. I'm not because there's some stuff in there I've adjusted. <laughs> I'm putting cheese on my burger. I'm not eating no burger without no cheese. That's just it. <laughs> and if I want a piece of bacon, I'm going to eat a piece of bacon. I don't care what you say. <laughs> I'm just going to keep it. I've adjusted. If you don't like what the book say, tear it out. Live by the rest of it. All right, let's go. <laughs> Call it in and then 7946. What's your name? Where you calling from? Oh, that's me. Hey, Uncle Larry, you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. What's up, man? Hey, this is Nathaniel, a.k.a. Samuel Hurston. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, to the, sh- the, um, the show was very, 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 very thorough. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure a lot of people were uplifted with it. 
Um, I'm besides myself when I see the people that insert themselves in the name of their Christianity and their faith, Mm. and they automatically become the negative. We preach so much what God is and what love is and so on, but they come in and they are automatically the opposite. Mm. Sometimes people have to understand how harsh they are in the name of God. Mm. You Mm. are so quick to go to a sexual thing, in my opinion, as a gay man, Mm. I know the topic of sex is has a little perversion from both sides. If you look at a person and the first thing you think about is who they bed, what they do with their body, to me, that's a little bit of a shaky perversion. You should okay. never look at anybody, heterosexual, anybody, and first thing you think about is, I wonder who they fucking. <laughs> in reality, in, in any across the board, myself, I grew up in a foster home, I had my grandpa there, I had mentors there, mm-hmm. I had strong women to reinforce things for me to grow up, and I grew up well-rounded. Mm-hmm. As a gay man, I kept my body, I grew up as a regular human, because people forget in this world, we have something called racism, ethnicity, and I'm black before anything else. Mm-hmm. So I had to learn how to walk this earth as a black man before I can walk this earth as a gay anything, even if that makes sense, because to me it doesn't make sense. I'm not going to walk the earth via who I choose to bed. That makes sense. The moment I was, the moment I chose to look at myself in this world, growing up and looking at adults telling you, you going to hell, Christian, foster mother, whoever else, they was all liars because Mm. they was down there doing the dirt themselves. Mm. I had to take it to myself. Mm. Me keeping myself as a man, a black man first on this earth, and then all that other gay sh- <laughs> okay? <laughs> I am now walking in nine years in a relationship with another strong black man. Okay, got a question. You, okay. are y'all, do, you, do you practice ethics in that relationship? Meaning, are, are you honest? First yes. of all, okay. okay. Yeah. Yes, a thousand percent all the time. Mm-hmm. We pray, all, we, everything I saw my grandparents do, I mimic in my household. From the cleanliness, from us working, from praying for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, the things that we are around. I understand people have a, um, an imagination of the gay lifestyle and what they think gay people do. Myself, I've seen that. It's the club. It's the fast sex. It's because gay people were pushed in the closet for so long. I, 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 mean, I, 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 understand, I understand that now more than I ever had before, not just from the yes. LBGT community, but when she put it in the language of like slavery and how we were piled on top of each other and, and how we were paired up and things that were done, it made me understand. And this is why what she said is so powerful, because she, ethics, sexual ethics, this, whether you are gay or straight, yes. we are screwed up. This this is not right. And, and it's, we got some work we got to do. The other day, Uncle Larry, I went to a business meeting. I'm going to make this real quick. Business mm-hmm. meeting. And I did, everybody had a business card except me. I had my Instagram. You know what I'm saying? Gave the lady my Instagram. She's an image consultant. First thing she said, she was like, your images are so curated. And I told her, even on social media and in real life, I have to manage myself. Mm. Because there's too many other adversities, other hurdles, other snakes, other so many things that you have to keep your guard up on, you know? So Jesus and God is first in your life as an individual. Mm. When you choose to go to the church, you open yourself up to that spirituality and everyone else in between. Okay? You're a part of that church. You can't do this. You can't do this. Abided by that church. But as an individual standing in God, Standing in your own ethics, in your own faith, keeps you a million percent more mm. so than following. Mm. <laughs> well, Kenna got rid of that one too. I'm so sorry. Thank you so much for calling in, sir. I'm going to take a couple of more calls and I'm done. Call it ending in 7414. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi, Larry. Can you hear me? Hey there. Hi, um, my name is Tawny J. I'm from H Town, Texas, okay. and I wanted to say like Bishop Flunder. Is that what it's Flunder? Yeah, Flunder. That's right. Flunder, Flunder, mm-hmm. Bishop Flunder. 
slundered me. Like, <laughs> from an Pentecostal background, then Church of God in Christ. I'm a preacher's kid. And just, I've never heard that before. That's mm-hmm. never been taught to me before. Mm-hmm. And I come from the church. Um, mm-hmm. In church, you know, all of my life, I've never heard about sexual ethics and your hermeneutic and mm. um, not harming yourself and others. Like, what the bleep did that <laughs> come from? And yeah. these people are mad on this post because she's speaking straight facts, whether yeah. you're gay or straight, like you said. She we got everybody. We are up, first yeah. of all. And how we treat people and how we treat ourselves, our perception is freaking screwed. That's yeah. why you got people um, on the pulpit twerking nowadays. Yeah. On video, mm. but um, did you see the video the where the where the boy was was sucked the sanctuary suck video? Man, I didn't want to see that. Yeah, I, I didn't want to see that. Man. I didn't want to see that. And the reason why is because I'm not a fan of the embarrassment that comes with that. Because uh, I can just imagine how embarrassed they are. But back to the lady who uh who was on here a couple of minutes ago, Flunder. stating that you know. No, not Bishop Flunder, the other girl. Okay. Um, stating that, uh, you know, when it, is, when it is okay to live a certain way uh, or to live however we want. She never said that. Like, no, she didn't say that? that. She didn't say it. She didn't say it. But um, I, I love the interview. I, I don't know if Bishop Flunder is my girl crush or my spiritual mother. I don't know. <laughs> I love her. She helped me today. She helped me understand more about my own sexuality, and I'm not even gay. Yeah, she got she got all of us. It was for all of us. I mean, cause it you know it, what I'm it makes you it, it ethics even as a single black man when I'm talk because there's about a few women I'm talking to, and I am sort of like shopping. It makes me. I, when it comes to a certain spot in the conversation, I'm gonna have to be more real. You know, I'm, I need to be make sure I'm ethical. I'm, I'm playing. All I'm, I'm not trying to hide nothing. I'm not trying to make this one feel like, oh, there may be in something in the future. I told um, one chick I was talking to earlier, they said, look, when you call me back, make sure when you call me back, you talk to me like I'm your husband. You know, I was playing, but right, right, but right. It, now it sort of makes me last think. thing I want to. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the last thing that I want to say is she giving these male bishops a run for their tithes and offerings. Because I didn't even know how to feel about female bishops uh, like that based off of the whole preachers of LABS. But now I'm going to have to go ahead and take a flight to visit her. Oh, that sounds good. Great. It's great to hear. Thanks so much for calling in. Thanks, Larry. Bye. Yeah, we, that whole ethics thing just it set it off for me. I mean, you can feel how you want to feel when it comes to LBGT, same gender loving. Hey. We all can feel and believe, like and dislike whatever we want to. This our life, but man, you gotta you gotta take what she said. Same thing with Cardin Pierce. There's some stuff he said like, whoa. Same thing with E. Bernard. That's why I'm gonna keep having these conversations. I got a plan to have some conversation with some people. Y'all probably not even gonna want to see them on this screen or sitting beside me, but I'm going to do it because out of those conversations, man, great things come. Even with Eddie Rohn, when I had him on and he gave out my address and whatever, I learned some things in that conversation as well. On Monday show, I'm going to introduce to you some things on Monday show. I got to show you some things on Monday show. Also, remember the movie Breakthrough with Devon Franklin and Chrissy Metz. I'm going to show you a little clip of that on Monday because it actually comes out for sale. And I need all of the LRLers to go and buy the DVD. If you, I know you may not have a DVD player. You may have Blu-ray. But go and purchase. I am going to be talking about that for about five minutes on Monday's show. You know, they were actually on the show and I interviewed them. And there's a new movie that is coming out called Overcomer. So I'm going to talk to you about that also on Monday for about five minutes. And I'm actually going to be doing the media there. And I'll probably go live from the live sh- for the screening here in Atlanta and do a Larry Live exclusive and interview a few of them that's going to be in that movie. All right. I'll talk to you later. I love you. I love you. I love you, LRLers, today. All right. Talk to you later. Bye. See you. Coming July 12th on all digital platforms, Larry D. Reed's new CD, One Music, Volume 2. Featuring hit singles on top. 
circles. I feature. Users, pre order One Music Volume 2 today and receive an instant download of Smile featuring Brian Andrew Wilson and Larry D. Reed. Download your copy of Larry D. Reed's One Music Volume 2, releasing on all digital music platforms coming July 12th.